so delighted to see everyone here. Thank you for coming to this community conversation. I am Elizabeth Francis, and I'm the Executive Director of the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities. Loren M. Spears, Narragansett Niantic, will offer a welcome and a blessing. I'm 
so excited about this special opportunity to welcome the chair of the National Endowment for the Humanities, Shelley C. Lowe. and to talk about the humanities and civic health. Thank you, Senator Reed, for hosting Chair Lowe and this wonderful visit. I also want to thank Jack Martin and the Providence Public Library for hosting us in this essential and generative space for civic health. Among his many roles and responsibilities as a leader in the United States Senate, Senator Jack Reed has worked very hard to ensure that the National Endowment for the Humanities and the National Endowment for the Arts are funded at robust levels. And I want to recognize my colleague, Executive Director of the Rhode Island State Council for the Arts, Lynn McCormick, We are deeply grateful for the record increase in the NIH budget for 2023. And we're grateful because it means that the humanities and arts will reach more Rhode Islanders and that the humanities and art, art, arts will have a deeper and more extensive impact on all of our lives. Senator Reed is also is committed to the humanities and arts not just as a legislator. He takes part in many activities and events, and it's always a pleasure to see him. And it is a pleasure to ask Senator Reed now to say a few words. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, for that very kind introduction. I also want to thank Warren for that beautiful prayer and thoughtful reminder foremost in our minds. Uh, let me join and uh, with everyone salute and welcome the uh, chair, Sean Lowe, to the Rhode Island. Uh, we're very proud to have the chair of the National Talents and Humanities, and also very special assistant, Allison Chair, today. Welcome to Rhode Island. Um, we started in the socket. Uh, we travel all the way up there. <laughs> <laughs> and we were now in Providence, so we can't go stay I think it's fitting that we hold this discussion just a, a few days as we prepare for the Martin Luther King celebration because it's time to reflect on what he called the beloved community. It's time to answer the call to service. And it's also a thing that we hold this discussion at the Providence Public Library. I'd like to thank Jack Mark for hosting us today. The library is a true community hub. Uh, it supports learning, community connection, civic participation, economic development, and it's also an example of the difference that the national economic communities makes in communities across this country. Without their support, this library would not be as capable, as accessible, and as effective in the community. So I thank you for that. This beautiful renovation is just a one part of it. Well, we have also recognized the Rhode Island Council to the and Elizabeth's tremendous leadership, but uh, we're very proud of what you do each and every day to enhance uh, the community <laughs> in Rhode Island, which means really to enhance and strengthen the community of Rhode Island all the news around. One example of what you've done is the Civic Health Index Report. It's also another <coughs> example of NEH funding, because NEH funding helped out tremendously. This project brought the Humanities Council together, the Rhode Island Secretary of State Office together, the Rhode Island Foundation, other partners, and it provides an important baseline about our strengths and challenges, and it sets the stage for how we can plan to Together, and part of our discussion today will touch on those issues. Uh, but before we get started, I'd like to welcome uh, my colleague, Congressman David Sisolini, 
first of all, they get when I see it, I, I ain't got everything. And they bring out David is an extraordinary man of his college. And he has a task that I cannot envy him. Uh, he has two House of Representatives. But he's up to the task. He has led us in so many different ways. His efforts for antitrust, his efforts for maintaining the constitutional order um, by uh, checking the excessive power of the president, all those things make us awful proud to have David as our company. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Jack, for those nice words. Um, and thank you for your extraordinary leadership uh, at the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Endowment for the Humanities. We take uh, incredible pride uh, because of the legacy of the great late Senator Claiborne Pell, responsible for the creation of both. But Senator Reed has been a steward of the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Endowment since their creation and since he began to service the United States Senate and Rhode Island and our country are better for it. So thank you, Senator. It's uh, a great pleasure to welcome Chair Lowe to Rhode Island and thank you for being with us today for this important first ever discussion of our Civic Health Index and thank you to Elizabeth Francis and the State Council on the Humanities for all of the work that you do, uh, and your partner in that, Lynn McCormick, thank you. Um, this 2022 Rhode Island Civic Health Index really is an opportunity to provide us with a benchmark, as Senator Reed said, of where we are, where we're going, and how we get there together as a community. And it uh, identifies some really important strengths for our state uh, and areas that we need to work on together to improve. Um, it, in, it highlights, for example, that Rhode Islanders are engaged with our political institutions at a very high rate, something I know Jack and I can attest to personally by context in our office and encourage you to keep doing that. But it also, um, I think, provides us with some important warnings about the barriers that are created by geographic and racial disparities in our state and really calls on us to address these inequalities and inequities in real and tangible ways. And I know we will do that as a community. And it celebrates that we nationally stand out, I think, first in the country as um, because of our strong connections with our family and friends, which is something I think we all uh, find unsurprising. Um, and uh, of course, also acknowledges that our state has a really rich history of communities working together to address the most serious problems facing our community. And I think Rhode Island has a really rich tradition of that, of coming together to face big challenges. And I think, you know, if you think about what has happened in the recent past, you know, a deadly pandemic, serious threats to our democracy, the harsh realities of racial injustice in our community, and the heartbreaking instances of gun violence. You think of all those experiences, and what we need more than ever is Rhode Islanders to come together, really invoke the work of the Rhode Island Council on the Humanities, and be sure that we're supporting the kinds of investments that are gonna move us forward together in a way that creates the beloved community that Senator Reed and Dr. King spoke about. So I very much look forward to the panel discussion. I want to thank Chair, Chair Lowe for being here today and thank Loren for that beautiful prayer uh, and for reminding us where we stand today as we begin this conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. And now it is my great privilege and honor to introduce the 12th chair of the National Endowment for the Humanities, Shelley Lowe. <laughs> chair Lowe is the kind of leader Senator Pell had in mind when he wrote the legislation to establish the National Endowment for the Arts and Humanities. He knew that a great democracy provides opportunities for all people to engage in the realm of ideas and the spirit, as he indicated. Uh, this is part of the National Endowment of the Humanities mission, and no one can carry that mission out better than Chair Lowe. She brings a commitment to this great organization. And as a citizen of the Navajo Nation, Chair Lowe brings critical cultural and life experience to fulfilling NEH's mission. She also brings a deep academic expertise to this work. She has a distinguished record of service in the humanities as a member of the National Council for the Humanities from 2015 to 2021, 
and as a scholar and leader in higher education at institutions such as the University of Arizona, Harvard, and Yale. It is a privilege to host here at Lower Rhode Island, and I hope that this is the first of many visits that you will return. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming NEH Chair Shelley Welch. Good afternoon. Yad Esh, Shalilo Yen Sheh, Bilagana Nishlin, Nanastasia Tachinu Bashachi, Bilagana Dashache, Do Traban Dashnalin, Lakantia, the Nasha, Do Washington, the Shagan. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Shelley Lowe. I am Navajo. I'm originally from Ganado, Arizona, and I currently live in Washington, D.C. Uh, first, I want to thank Senator Reed. Thank you for those kind words. Thank you for the invitation to come up to visit Rhode Island. I traveled really far today. <laughs> well, I traveled far. I started last night at the airport, and I drove all the way up to Providence. <laughs> then he took me on a long ride this morning up to Woonsocket and back here. So it's been wonderful. Parts of uh, Rhode Island I haven't seen before. Roads I haven't been on yet, so that's been very exciting for me. Uh, I also want to thank Elizabeth Francis for all of your leadership at the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities and all of the board members who are here today. I have this cool pin that they gave me to represent. You guys are NEH on the ground and I just want to thank you for everything that you do and for being part of our agency and for being our voice and reaching out to those communities that we don't always get to talk to and reach out to when we're in our offices in Washington, D.C. Thank you so much for all you do. Congressman Cicilline, thank you so much for being here and thank you for your kind words and for pointing out that we're going to have a conversation about the um, Civics Index here in Rhode Island and for noting that the um, new report and the index tells us exactly the areas that we have an opportunity to make an impact that we have the opportunity to come in and really pay attention to and really do the best that we can to make an impact and encourage civic engagement within everybody, the entire population in Rhode Island and encourage that more broadly and nationally. So I'm, I'm really excited to be having this conversation. Um, but I also want to say hehe to Loren um, and to the indigenous people of the Northeast because I lived in the Northeast for 15 years prior to moving down to Washington, D.C. And I was always invited in to learn more about your cultural ways, your lifestyles, your understandings, the history of this area, um, how I fit in when I come in as a visitor and then a resident who is living here. Um, and I just want to thank you for sharing that and for bringing that to the forefront and for opening it up and welcoming us in that way. So thank you. Yes. Okay. I'm learning. I didn't get to learn this much before I moved to DC, but I'm learning. Uh, so we're really excited to have this conversation today and we'll, we'll be asking panelists some questions. But I want to say uh, we were very excited. We've got a $27 million increase in our budget, which means we're really going to yeah, thank you. to do uh, what my vision is is to reach populations communities and areas that we haven't reached and we've got a lot of work to do in that in terms of um, NEH and the agency and what we've been funding and who we've been reaching conversations like this are exactly the way that we'll start to do that to hear directly from constituents to hear directly from individuals about the good work that they're doing and the impact and the outreach that we're making but also those areas that we can continue to have an impact one of the really exciting announcements that we made the, um, just earlier this week on Tuesday is a $1.7 million cooperative agreement with the educational nonprofit iCivics. And this is a continuation of the Educating for American Democracy initiative, which is at the perfect timing in terms of the Rhode Island Civics Index and thinking about how do we really support civics education? What role do each of us play? But how do our cultural institutions play a role in that? And how can we connect them to schools and connect them to curriculum for all ages to really move us forward? So I think that we're going to have a really great conversation this afternoon. And I, I thank everybody for coming here. And I thank the library in particular for hosting us this, in this beautiful location with all of the new renovations and showing us what really can happen within some of our cultural institutions. So I think we'll turn it over and we'll have have a conversation, but Elizabeth.
I'll just say a few words about the Civic Health Index and then we'll have the conversation. So with support from the NEH A More Perfect Union Initiative, as well as the Rhode Island Foundation, and I want to thank the, um, the, member, the staff members who are here from the Rhode Island Foundation, your support has meant so much to us. The Humanities Council has led the development of the state's first ever Civic Health Index. We were very proud to partner with the Secretary of State's office and many, some members of the Secretary of State's office are here today and we were um, very glad to see you and very um, proud to have worked with you and to, will continue to do so. And with the National Conference on Citizenship, which has done Civic Health Indexes uh, all over the country uh, and they're based in, in, um, in DC. Rhode Island's approach uh, to the Civic Health Index is unique, of course, um, in that it expands beyond the traditional definitions of civic health and indicators that are in the supplemental census data, I'm not gonna get into that, about you know, that, that, is, that is traditionally used for the Civic Health Index. We go beyond that uh, to include more community-driven measures of engagement. And we worked with community partners uh, who represent communities all over the state to develop the Rhode Island Civic Health Index Survey, which was offered in English and Spanish. Um, and this was last May. I'm looking at Julia, yes. And I think many of you filled it out. I hope, I hope you did, but um, many hundreds and hundreds, 700, over 700 people filled out the survey, which is remarkable. Um, and I also want to recognize the community partners who are here today. Um, and if you could just stand, Wanda Hopkins, Tapia, thank you. We wanted to expand the process to be more inclusive of other measures of civic health related to cultural and humanities engagement as well, which included mining existing data sources and asking specific questions about history, cultural participation, monuments and media, and their connection to civic health. So I want to acknowledge the community partners, the Secretary of State's office, and advisors to the index. Thank you. And I also want to recognize Julia Renault, the Associate Director of Grants and Strategic Initiatives at the Humanities Council, who led this effort, who co-wrote the report, and, um, and did so much to make it happen. So you can, I think all of you have maybe picked up this info already, but you can learn more about the index um, through the executive summary and copies of the report that are in the reception area outside of this room. And community engagement with the index led by community partners is taking place through the spring and there will be a culminating gathering hosted by the Humanities Council in April or May. So stay tuned for that. So let's get to the conversation and I would like to welcome our panelists, Charles Roberts of the Rhode Island Slave History Medallions. Charles, will you come up? <laughs> um, uh, Marta Martinez of Rhode Island Latino Arts. And Kelly Siegel Steckler of the uh, Tufts Center for, I'm not gonna get it right, the circle group that is focused, does, does so much amazing research and policy work on civic engagement at Tufts University. We have several questions, and I, I think that it, uh, there, uh, I wanted to ask um, specific people to address them. I hope that's okay. So uh, Marta and Charles, Rhode Island is known for its creative economy and its robust and diverse arts, humanities and arts organizations. What role do your organizations play in promoting civic health? And I just, you know, just to, um, this civic health includes community well-being, social connections, public participation, collective understanding, and engagement with government. 
So Marta, why don't you start off? Sure. Um, thank you. Thank you for having me here. Uh, um, I am the executive director of Rhode Island Latino Arts, and we uh, provide arts education, and we also have a humanities program and collect oral histories. And it's through, through the, the fusion of both of those two uh, genres that, that really makes us more successful. Uh, one of our most successful programs took place during the pandemic, and it was with funding from both RICH, the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities, and the Rhode Island State Council for the Arts. And we um, were able to bring people outside and make them feel safe um, out in Broad Street, which is in the South Providence neighborhood. And it's, it's an area where there's a high number of Latinos. And, and at the time, during the pandemic, we were seeing the numbers that the Latinos were the highest being in, um, affected by the pandemic. Um, and we were able to bring them out through art. We created um, a street mural and a sidewalk mural. And we also took the opportunity to, to talk to them because we, had, we were also hearing um, and reading in, in the paper that some, there was misinformation, and per, particularly because of the language barrier. You, they were hearing information from national news. They were trying to stay on top of um, information from their, some of the people who have uh, family members in other countries. It was in in English, it was just misunderstood. And so we took that opportunity to make sure that they focused locally to really look at what was going on around them. And we invited outreach workers to, to send them to, to places where they could get tested, where they could learn more about the pandemic, and, and just basically outside and, and to paint, to uh, enjoy. And the, the mural that we painted, was uh, led by a local artist, and it's, it's a really colorful mural, and she took um, the theme of the pandemic and neighborhood and, and created this um, really mural that still is there, and it, it, it brings joy. People were, were, see, were telling us that they felt uh, not just safe to be there, but, but they were glad to be outside and, and in community. So uh, through the two uh, funding sources and, and the two um, areas that we, we um, focus on. That's how we contribute it to the, to the community. Thank you. Thank you. Charles, would you like to say a few words? And, I, and, I, um, and please say a little something about the, uh, the, the Slave History Medallions Project. Oh, thank you, Ms. Uh, Elizabeth. Uh, oh, this is on. Um, I'm the founder and executive director of Rhode Island Slave History Medallions. And what we do, we're a place-based organization. We mark the landscape with stories of indigenous and African-American people involved in really what I say, the creation of this country and of this state through the economic development they produced through their, their slave labor. Uh, our, 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 and I started this as really just an artist. I was just trying to make a piece of public art. And I went from working in pastels to bronze. And one of these times that I was walking through my neighborhood, the graveyard in Newport, uh, Gods of the Laker, I noticed that I was walking in a sea of angels because all of these carvings were these carved angels. And then I said, well, who carved this? I find out that it was carved by Pompey Stevens in 1768 for his brother, Cuffy Gibbs. And, and by marking this landscape and by making these medallion, these gravestones, these angel images, what he did was, first of all, he recognized his own freedom and he gave an identity uh, to the whole idea that the contributions of the state were made by slaves. And this is why we took that particular image and we've put them in uh, right now 11 locations across the state of Rhode Island. 12 will be next week. So that young people could go to these medallions and see the QR codes that are involved with them and with their phone click on the, on the QR code and see the history so they, they could see that 
the place where they stood is holy ground. This is the place of their ancestors. And they can get a chance to engage in it and be a part of it. And that's what we do at Rhode Island Slave History Medallions. Right. Anything else? Thank you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So Chair Lowe, as Rhode Island Civic Health Index notes, the pandemic affected more than individuals' physical and mental health. It took a toll on our civic health. How has federal funding through the National Endowment for the Humanities helped build capacity to improve our civic health? Thank you, that's a, that's a wonderful question. And I think one of the things that I will point out to everyone here in the audience is a new initiative that we rolled out a few months ago called American Tapestry, weaving together past, uh, present, and future. Part of American Tapestry, one of the threads that we're focusing on is democracy and how do we really build programming and strengthen the teaching of democracy, um, but civics education across the country. And we've got a couple of areas that we're really focused on. The iCivics project that um, the cooperative agreement that we have just funded at $1.7 million is one of the inroads into trying to strengthen civics education across the country. iCivics will work with uh, pilot schools that will partner with cultural institutions to really build robust uh, democratic teaching for K through 12 institutions. One of the things that we've, that's been pointed out to us, um, the American History Association did a recent report that noted the general public looks at cultural institutions and historic sites as experts in, in history, but that's not where they turn to when they want to learn about history. They're turning to documentaries and podcasts and movies that they see on TV, right? The easy things that they can access. And the American History Association has um, kind of looked at it and said the reason why they look at the cultural centers or the museums, cultural centers, and historic sites is because there are objects there, things that they can actually see and tie to their civics education and their learning about democracy. So tying the and making connections between these cultural institutions and K through 12 schools, we hope will really enhance learning with young people so that they can really think about um, let me see it, but let me also touch it, hold it, understand this democracy in a way that I may not fully or quite grasp as well if it's just something that I'm watching in a classroom, right? If it's just something that I'm hearing or a book that I'm reading. We're really excited about that part. But I think the other part is um, we, and the Civics Health Index touched upon this, is thinking about media and what does media do and what role does media play? Media and technology. We have a new program rolling out through our Office of Digital Humanities that is looking for projects that will take a human uh, humanities perspective on the dangers and the opportunities of technology. And some of this could really be looking at how do we learn from the media? What are we learning? What are the pitfalls of what we miss out when things are presented to us in one format by one organization or, or one um, kind of view and is not really giving us a full perspective of an issue or a full perspective of something that has happened. Um, we're really excited about this, um, this new grant opportunity. We've got lots of applications coming in because we do want to understand how does technology play a role in how we understand and how we, we receive information about our democracy, about our civics education and the roles that we each play. And how do we rely on that technology or the media or lack of media in presenting what we should be hearing and what we should be learning and knowing. And, and I think that a part of this is, is really a focus on if we understand democracy, we understand how to kind of infuse civics education, we would also need to understand what can threaten our democracy and how do we address those threats and how do we make sure that the work that we do really is pushing forward um, a balanced kind of understanding and teaching of our democracy, um, but addressing those, you know, the dangers and opportunities at the same time. Thank you. So we'll start with Senator Reed with this question. Um, and something that we learned, we heard very strongly as we, um, as we worked on the Civic Health Index and from the comments on the survey, that there really seems to be 
um, a great longing for greater social connection, public participation, and understanding across diverse communities, and greater engagement with government. But we also learned that many of our social structures, from housing to healthcare to school attendance to news and social, and social media practices, keep us apart and keep us insular and keep us divided. So, Senator Reid, what are your thoughts about overcoming those barriers, both the longing for, those, for greater connection and the things that are keeping that from happening? Well, thank you, Elizabeth. I think first, uh, you're absolutely right. We're divided by many things, and some of them are housing, transportation systems, et cetera. So what I hope we can do with the federal resources that we've provided to the nation, but particularly Rhode Island, is improve our, our housing situation so that people can uh, afford, really, to live uh, in places that are not only adequate, but are, are comfortable for families. Second, uh, we, we have a challenge to make sure that our educational system is benefiting every child in the state, and sometimes that's not the case because of other factors, funds, financing, et cetera. Uh, and then I think uh, we have made progress in Rhode Island, and sometimes we have to stop and you know, say, you know, we did some things well. For example, we're the number one state in the country for vaccination of children. We probably have one of the best children's health care programs in the United States. And we were attacking issues like uh, uh, lead in uh, the, the air and exposure to lead, done it very, very well. So we, in that spectrum, we've, done, we've made progress. So we can make progress. We just have to focus on the problem uh, and develop solutions, not arbitrary solutions that are imposed, uh, but thoughtful solutions that are people are brought together. And I think that that's out there. There's something else we've got to do, and that's you know, in the essence, I think, of, of the humanities, et cetera, is to continually be able, through different art, the theater, arts, et cetera, uh, show that we are all people. We all have common connections. We have different ethnicities, different races, but there's a common connection. And in the United States, uh, that common connection is something that, you know, w we would hope would be so prevalent. There's one more difficulty this time, and the chair alluded to it, is that we're facing an information spectrum today much more complicated and in some respects dangerous than my childhood, where there was three TV stations. They were regulated by the federal government under the, the FCC. Uh, there was the equal time rule, et cetera. Now we have a, a fusion of information and entertainment, uh, which passes for news. Uh, but we also have very deliberate disinformation, people who are, are putting forward uh, notions that are not accurate deliberately. So one of the challenges in education today is being able to educate children and everybody of what's not right, you know, what's just plain wrong, which, you know, and we didn't have that challenge uh, two decades ago. You know, we could present the, the information and that was that. But that's something else that we have to do. So there's a whole task before us, but I think the most significant one is trying to remind every American that we're one country and one people with different communities. Uh, just, uh, I don't want to belabor this, but it was interesting. And one of the values of the, of the humanities is we were up at the Winsaga Museum of Work and Culture, and we were walking around, and I saw this copy of a 1870s Harper's Weekly, and it had a cartoon on it. And the cartoon was a scale. The scale was in balance. On one side was the south. On one side was the north. And on the southern scale, there was an African-American. And on the northern scale, there was an Irish guy, all stereotypically demeaned in the illustration, saying, hey, you got your problem, we got our problem. And a lot of people forget that, you know, that, that, you know, all of our, all of our communities have come through difficult times. 
And rather than making it difficult for them, we should recognize how we owe them something that perhaps we didn't get, which is understanding, support, and uh, help to move forward. I want if, if we have time, I'd like to return to this question, but I want to um, ask Kelly, uh, because I think it really ties in with what Senator Reed was saying, that, um, that young people in Rhode Island, I think as you learned from your work with Generation Citizen, have demanded that our public education system, for at least some students, not all students, some students have demanded that our public education system prepare them with the knowledge and skills to be active citizens. And so I wanna, if you would just say what your connection is um, to, to this work around civic health and civic education here in Rhode Island, and then what does a 21st century <coughs> civic education look like? And I will just say that when we were at the Museum of Working Culture, there's, I think many of you have been there, there is a um, classroom uh, and there's a blackboard and there's three assignments, um, and the third assignment is civics. And I just thought, I, that, I don't know if that happens all the time here anymore. But anyway, I will turn it over to you, or in any in, in the way that would be compelling. So, yeah. So um, I, along with our partners at Generation Citizen, um, last year we authored a report called "The State of Civic Education in Rhode Island," which is really a sister report to the Rhode Island Civic Health Index. Um, we heard from about a thousand students around Rhode Island as well as quite a few educators, um, teachers and administrators at public schools, charter schools, um, all over the state um, to try and understand sort of where are we at in Rhode Island with how things are going um, and where is there yet to go, right? What are the needs and challenges? Um, so we did notice that uh, young people do want better civic engagement uh, and civic education in their schools, right? Um, students are excited. They want opportunities to learn about their communities and their role in their communities. Teachers feel ready and capable to teach civic education. Um, but what they're often missing is the time and space in their schools to make room for those things, to see civics as a priority, to feel like there's both from the community below them and administration above them, that everybody cares about civics and that it's worth making time for alongside reading, writing, and arithmetic that we think of as the core aspects of um, education. And I think a lot of how we address that, and this is a big part of my answer to what does a 21st century civic education look like, um, as one of my colleagues is fond of saying, when we talk about increasing civic education in schools and really high quality civic education, it's not that we're putting something else on their plate, right? Teachers and schools are already challenged and tasked with doing so much to address the health and the civic health of our society, but really civics is the plate, right? Everything that happens in school is part of our civic development and understanding. For most young people, going to a public school is the longest and most sustained interaction that they will have with a public institution throughout their entire lives. Um, and every interaction that they have at the school, everything that they do every day, really forms their relationship to broader society through that connection. And so building schools holistically that think of civics as part of their core mission, um, preparing young people to be active members of their communities, whether that community is local or global or national or state, right, um, across the curriculum and in non-curricular and extracurricular activities that students do every day. Um, so while, yes, social studies is important and students need to learn about history and the world around them um, and interact with different kinds of perspectives and ideas, they also need to be part of a democratic community in their own school where they feel like their voice matters, where um, they have opportunities to connect other things that they're learning um, to the broader world in science and in mathematics, um, in English, and um, to have opportunities to take part in something, whether it's within their schools or outside of their schools in their extracurricular life, to learn to be a part of a group, to contribute to a community, um, and to 
develop that habit and that skill of going out into the world and taking part and caring about the people around them and how they can change their lives. Getting a little, I'm sorry, a little close on time. So what I would like to do is ask um, a final question that also can be turn it over, be turned over to you um, um, uh, uh, here today. So and so, let's just do a lightning round. Just say a phrase or a sentence. Um, so one of the questions the Civic Health Index asks is, how do we move forward together? How do you answer that question? What's one answer to that question? Conversation, communication. Great. Well, I would say by kind of embracing a new normal that is inclusive of all peoples, and we're talking about it. one of the things we do is we make sure before we do a, a, a program, we do a land acknowledgement, because we have to acknowledge the people that were here first before all of the other nationalities that were here. I would say taking a lifelong approach to civic engagement that starts from early childhood and continues to grow and change throughout our lives. Well, I'll leave the last word for the chair. Uh, no, I think the, the, the key is to uh, develop uh, through the humanities, through education, a perception of everyone that we have a common humanity. I mean, we talk about the humanities, that's it. We have a common humanity that when you meet someone, they have some of the, they have the same impulses of good, bad, and indifferent that you, and you have to begin to understand them first before you stereotypically put them in a box and throw them away or do other things. I think I, I would add, and this becomes one of the challenges for NEH and I'm sure for many of you in, in the audience, having a common, easily understood, easily explained definition. Right, so I think it's really difficult to talk to the general public about what humanities is because they don't kind of grasp humanities. And I think it may be the same for getting people to understand what does it mean to be civically engaged? What is civic engagement? If we can break that barrier in terms of individuals understanding what we're talking about, first and foremost, that would be a huge step forward.